Investment in real assets requires a lot of money. Cash generated from internal accruals and equity contribution from shareholders may not often be sufficient. To meet these financing requirements, firms go for bank loans and issue bonds. These are called fixed income securities or simply called loans. There is always a risk that the issuer of the loan may not be able to generate sufficient cash to prepay the interest and principal obligations. In the context of bonds, these interest obligations are often called coupons. If this happens, the issuer of the instrument that is borrower may default on their obligations. Generally, if the issuer is a government body or municipality, the investors are confident about the creditworthiness of the security. However, if it is a private entity with not so strong fundamentals and sound financial position, then there is always a possibility of default. We start our discussion of fixed income securities by examining the valuation of bonds. The interest or coupon on these bonds are not same as the cost of capital for the issuing corporation. Corporations cannot borrow at the same risk-free rate as those availed by governments and quasi-government bodies. They have to pay some additional interest that is spread, which reflects the business risk and financial condition of that firm. Moreover, if the risk-free rates, that is rates at which governments borrow, go up or down, this would also affect the interest rates for corporates. Thus, corporate bonds are considered as riskier due to the possibility of default also, they are less liquid than government bonds. In this lesson, we'll discuss the valuation of fixed income securities with the help of discounted cash flow valuation tools. We'll analyze the term structure of interest rates and its implications for valuation of fixed income securities. We'll try to understand various theories that explain the dynamics of a rising or falling term structure of interest rates. Using the tools acquired in the discounted cash flow techniques, we'll understand and compute a very important measure of bond market instrument called yield to maturity. We'll examine the interest rate risk associated with the fixed income securities with the help of the duration measure. We'll understand the theory behind this duration measure and also computation of this measure. Simple valuation of fixed income securities, FIS. In this video, we'll be introduced to fixed income securities, FIS. We'll understand the cash flow profile of fixed income securities such as bonds. We'll also discuss the concept of yield to maturity by TM for a fixed income security. If you own a fixed income security like a bond, you are entitled to a fixed set of payoffs called interest or coupons. These payments will continue until the security matures. Till then, you collect regular interest payments. At maturity, you get the face value or the principal of that fixed income security. Consider a simple bond that pays 8.5% interest. If you have invested $100, you will get $8.5 annually if the coupons are annual. And at maturity, you will also get the principal amount that is total $108.5. Assume a 3% discount rate. So far, whatever we have discussed in the present value concept and cash flow discounting, it is not too difficult for us to compute the present value of this bond. It can be easily computed as follows. Present value PV equal to 8.5 upon 1.03 plus 8.5 upon 1.03 raised to power 2 plus 8.5 upon 1.03 raised to power 3 plus 108.5 upon 1.03 raised to power 4 equal to 120.44 dollars. Also, given our knowledge of valuing annuities, we can separate the coupon payments and principal payment and compute the value of this bond in the manner as provided here. Present value of bond equal to present value of annuity of bond coupon payments plus present value of principal payment equal to 8.5 upon 0 0.03 multiplied by 1 minus 1 upon 1.03 raised to the power 4 plus 100 upon 1.03 raised to the power 4 equal to 31.59 plus 88.85 equal to 120.44 dollars. Put simply, the bond can be valued as a combination of annuity that is coupon payments and a single final payment of principal. Next, there is another very important concept related to fixed income securities such as bonds that is yield to maturity. For example, if the bond under discussion has a present value of $120.44, then what is the current interest rate or yield of this bond to the buyer? Bond being an instrument that is traded in financial markets, its price fluctuates with the interest rates. As the interest rates rise, bond prices fall and when the interest rates fall, bond prices rise. They should be very easily understood from the discounted cash flow valuation of the bond that we saw earlier. Let us compute the YTM or yield to maturity of this bond 
that is presently selling at 120.44 dollars using our knowledge of discounted cash flow valuation technique we can write the bond price expression in ytm yield to maturity terms as shown here 120.44 equal to 8.5 upon 1 plus yield to maturity plus 8.5 upon 1 plus ytm raised to the power 2 plus 8.5 upon 1 plus ytm raised to power 3 plus 108.5 upon 1 plus ytm raised to the power 4 since we just saw that at 3% discount rate the PV of this bond worked out to 120.44 therefore its YTM at this price should be 3% only. This also means that if you buy this bond and hold it to maturity you will earn a return of 3% per annum. An interesting question is that why this bond has a YTM that is less than its coupon of 8.5%. A simple answer to this question is that you are paying 120.44 dollars for a bond with a face value of 100 dollars. That is, the bond is selling at a premium. Many software packages and financial calculators are available that help you to calculate yield to maturity easily. Mm. Consider the example of a simple bond with the cash flow profile as shown here. Coupons amounting to $24.375 are paid semi annually, and at the end of the period, a principal payment of $1000 is paid at the end of 3 years. If the bond is currently trading at $1107.95 then the current yield to maturity of the bond can be simply computed from this equation provided here that is present value equal to 24.375 upon 1 plus YTM by 2 plus 24.375 upon 1 plus YTM by 2 raised to the power 2 plus 24.375 upon 1 plus YTM divided by 2 raised to the power 3 and so on up till 1024.375 upon 1 plus YTM by 2 raised to the power 6. Here YTM that is yield to maturity divided by 2 equal to 0.6003% or yield to maturity YTM equal to 1.2006%. The division by a factor of 2 indicates that seminal compounding aspect. So the yield is quoted in annual terms at 1.2006%. However, given the seminal compounding, the 6 monthly yield works out to 0.6003%. The effective annual yield EF would be 1.6003 raised to power 2 minus 1 equal to 1.2042%. This yield of course higher than the quoted annual rate of 1.2006%. To summarize, in this video we examined the cash flow profile of fixed income securities such as bank loans and bonds. The cash flow on these fixed income securities included regular interest payments and principal payment or face value at maturity. We also discussed the concept of while TM that is yield to maturity. If the cash loss from an FIS that is fixed income security is discounted at yield to maturity, one obtains the current price of the fixed income security. Bond prices and interest rates. We will discuss the discounted cash flow valuation of fixed income securities. We will also examine the relationship between interest rates and fixed income security prices. Bond prices change with interest rates. In the previous example where the semi annual yield was 0.6%, Assume investors start demanding a semi annual yield of 4% that is annual percentage quoted rate of 8%. The price of this bond will fall to reflect this change in yield. Saying that prices have fallen is equivalent to that yields have risen. The new price can be easily computed with discounted cash flow method as shown here. Present value PV equal to 24.375 divided by 1.04 plus 24.375 divided by 1.04 raised to the power 2 and so on up to 1024.375 divided by 1.04 raised to the power 6 equal to 918.09 dollars. The cash flow discounting relation makes it quite obvious that with rising interest rates prices would fall and with falling interest rates prices would rise. This explains why bond prices and interest rates move in the opposite direction. Let us examine the price interest rate relationship for two bonds with the same coupon of 4.875% the relationship is shown in the figure here. It must be noted that the impact of interest rate is only modest on near term cash flows while it is more drastic on distant cash flows. This is precisely the reason why the price of a 30 year bond is much more sensitive to interest rate movements than a 3 year bond. In fact for the 30 year bond the fall in prices is particularly sharp at lower interest rates. To summarize in this video, we examined the relationship between interest rates and fixed income security prices. We found that the price of an FIS that is fixed income security is inversely related to the interest rates. If interest rates rise, prices fall and if interest rates fall, prices rise. Duration of a bond. 
we'll discuss the concept of duration for fixed income securities. We'll also understand the computation of duration measure and its role in interest rate risk management. We saw that changes in interest rates have a greater impact on the prices of long term bonds than short term bonds. However, for fixed income securities such as bank loan or bonds, short term or long term is a vague reference. For example, consider a 30 year maturity bond with coupons spread over evenly across the 30 year period with principal payment occurring on the maturity, that is at the end of 30 year period. It would be misleading to describe this bond as a 30 year bond. Let us consider an example of strips that is separate trading of registered interest and principal securities. Strips are special instruments created by stripping the cash flows from treasury instruments and government securities where each cash flow tra trades as a bond. For such instruments only one cash flow occurs that is at the maturity and no coupon payment. These are often called as zero coupon bonds. Consider a strip with 30 year maturity that is a single payment occurring at the end of 30 years. It would not be misleading to say that this bond has a duration of 30 years. Consider three bonds, one strip and two coupon paying bonds with cash loss pro profile as provided here. All of these bonds have a YTM that is yield to maturity of 2%. Let us examine their time pattern of cash loss. Which one of these can be considered as longest term investment? Although all of them have the same maturity in February 2021, the cash flow profiles that is proportionate amounts distributed over the years is different for each of these bonds. The two coupon paying bonds offer a considerable proportion of their cash flows earlier than maturity. Thus, it is very easy to observe that the strip has the longest duration as explained earlier. Also, it is not too difficult to see that the bond with 11.25% coupon that is 5.625% seminal coupon offers a larger proportion of cash flows earlier than maturity as compared to the bond with lower coupon of 4% that is 2% seminal coupon. Therefore, the average maturity in cash flow terms should be higher for the 4% bond if these two bonds are compared. Because the larger proportion of cash flows come earlier for the 11.25% coupon bond, it can be easily understood that this bond has the lowest average maturity of cash flows across all the three bonds. However, we need a more concrete measure of duration. The discussion here offers the intuition for that measure of duration. Also, there is another important application of this duration measure, which is why investors and financial managers keep track of the duration measure. The duration measure also indicates the sensitivity of a fixed income security to interest rate changes. The simple measure of duration is computed as a weighted average of times with weights being the present value of cash flows received at these times. Consider a bond with a maturity of T years, the corresponding cash flows in each of these years being C1, C2 and so on up to CT being received at the end of years 1, 2, 3 up to T and present value of these cash flows as PV. The duration measure for this bond can be simply computed with the formula shown here. That is duration equal to 1 into present value of C1 upon present value of bond plus 2 into present value of C2 upon present value of bond and so on up till T into present value of CT divided by present value of bond. Let us understand this through one example. Consider a fixed income security with coupons of $8.5 paid at the end of each year and a final principal payment in the final year that is fourth year. Also assume the appropriate interest rate of 3%. Let us examine the computation of duration in the table provided here. Using this duration measure, a measure of sensitivity of fixed income security prices to interest rate changes is computed as shown here. This measure is often referred to as modified duration measure. Modified duration equal to duration upon 1 plus yield. This modified duration measures the percentage change in price for a 1 percentage change in yield or interest rates. For our bond of duration 3.6 years, this measure works out to 3.6 upon 1.03 equal to 3.49 percent. Now consider a scenario where interest rates rise by 0 0.5 percent and fall by the same amount. Let us compute the corresponding price changes as shown in the table here. The total magnitude of change works out to 1.72 plus 1.77 equal to 3.49 percent. This is the same amount as our modified duration measure. This also indicates that duration is an important measure of sensitivity of an instrument to changes in interest rates. Moreover, as the duration of an instrument increases, 
its sensitivity to interest rate changes also increases. Therefore, the interest rate risk of fixed income securities is computed with the help of this duration measure. Another important application of this duration measure is in managing the interest rate risk of portfolios. Often while designing portfolios, interest rate risks are suitably hedged or actively monitored to take a view on the interest rate changes. To execute these strategies, portfolio managers often rely on this duration measure for the fixed income securities. To summarize, in this video, we computed the duration measure of fixed income securities such as bonds. We found that a bond with a larger duration is more sensitive to interest rate movements, while a bond with a relatively smaller duration is less sensitive to interest rate movements. Thus, the duration of a bond is an important measure of its sensitivity to interest rate risk. Also, with the help of an example, we understood the computation of the modified duration measure. Term structure of interest rates. We will discuss the term structure of interest rates. We will also understand the important theories that explain different term structures. Till now, we have been using the same discount rate to calculate the present values for all the cash flows in each of the periods. A single yield to maturity was employed to compute the present value of fixed income securities like bond. This kind of approximation is very useful in many situations. However, we need to remember that interest rates vary over different tenors and short term interest rates are different from long term interest rates. This variation in interest rates over short term and long term and across periods is often referred to as the term structure of interest rates. This term structure is most often rising but sometimes can be falling as well. The figure provided here indicates all the possible term structures that is rising, falling and constant. Let us examine this behavior of term structure of interest rates. Consider the term structure of interest rates R1, R2, R3 and so on up to RT for time periods 1, 2, 3 and so on up to T. A simple cash flow of $1 in the first year will have a value of present value PV equal to 1 upon 1 plus R1. Here R1 would be called the 1 year spot rate. Similarly, a loan that pays $1 at the end of 2 years will have a present value of PV equal to 1 upon 1 plus R2 raised to the power 2. For simple illustration purposes, assume that R1 equal to 3% and R2 equal to 4%. A security that offers only these two cash flows will have a present value of PV equal to 1 upon 1.03 plus 1 upon 1.04 raised to the power 2 equal to 1.895. Now that we have the present values of this security, we can simply compute the yield to maturity that is YTM of the security with the simple formula provided here PV equal to 1 upon 1 plus YTM plus 1 upon 1 plus YTM raised to the power 2 equal to 1.895. Solving for this equation, we get YTM equal to 3.67%. Here we saw that spot rates for different maturities help us in determining the prices. Once the price is determined with the help of spot rates, yield to maturity that is YTM can be determined subsequently. In this backdrop, a very important concept is that of law of fund price. In well-functioning liquid and efficient markets, all safe dollars that is risk free cash flows must be discounted at the same risk free spot rate. This also holds true for cash flows of similar risk. For example, consider 4 risk gov free government bonds with annual coupon payments as shown here. Bond A is the shortest duration bond among all while the strip D is of the longest duration. The corresponding spot rates for each duration are provided here. The law of price says that each of these risk free dollars should carry the same value if received at the same date. For example, one dollar received in year 4 has the same value whether from bond A, B, C or D. This also means that one can use the same discount factor for each of the years 1, 2, 3 and 4 for all the bonds. Thus we compute the PV that is present value of all the bonds using spot rates for each of the years 1, 2, 3 and 4. Once the PV of these bonds is computed, yield to maturity YTM can also be easily computed. If you have understood the above concept, the procedure to estimate the spot rates for different maturities and therefore the term structure of interest rate is not too difficult. All you need is a bond with single cash flow that is strips for different maturities. Using the price of these strips, one can estimate the spot rates prevailing in the market for that maturity. For example, a 10 year strip with face value of $1000 at the end of maturity is selling at 714.18. This also means that for each $1 to be received after 10 years, investors are willing to pay $0.714 today. The 10 year spot rate can be easily computed from this information as provided here. 
df not equal to 1 upon 1 plus r 10 raised to the power 10 equal to 0 0.714. Solving for this r 10 equal to 3.42 percent. In this manner, one can estimate the entire term structure of interest rates. Lastly, there are a number of theories of term structure of interest rates as explained here. First, expectations theory of term structure. Term structure of interest rates reflect the expectation of interest rates in future. For example, a rising term structure indicates that market participants expect the interest rates to rise in future. Let us understand this through the example provided here. Assume that the spot rate for years 1 R1 is 5% and spot rate for year 2 R2 is 7%. If you invest $100 for one year, you get $5 for interest. If you invest it for two years, you get 100 into 1.07 raised to the power 2 that is $114.49 after two years. The extra return that you earn in second year can be computed as shown here. 1.07 raised to the power 2 divided by 1.05 minus 1 equal to 9%. This means that if you invest for 2 years, you will get 5% in year 1 and 9% in year 2. If you expect that bond prices in the year 2 will yield more, then you would prefer to invest in 1 year spot and then invest in second year at the prevailing rates. If many people would think like that, they will sell the second year bond and buy the first year bond. Ultimately, prices of these bonds have to adjust so that people are equally satisfied whether they are investing in one year spot or two year spot. Then the prices will be at equilibrium. This is often related to the expectations theory of term structure of interest rates. This theory suggests that in equilibrium, long term spot rates are a combination of short term spot and a series of forward rates. Forward rates are future rates booked today. For example, rate of interest for period t equal to 1 to t equal to 2 book debt t equal to 0 or interest rate for t equal to 2 to t equal to 4 book debt t equal to 0. Essentially, these forward rates reflect the future expectations of market participants. If expectations theory is to be believed, then these forward rates prevailing today will themselves materialize in future. To summarize, the expectations theory the only reason for an upward sloping term structure is that market participants or investors expect the short term rates to rise. Similarly, the only reason for a downward sloping term structure is that market participants expect the short term rates to fall. Next, we have liquidity preference theory. The expectations theory is not the complete explanation. Another important theory in this regard is the liquidity preference theory. Liquidity preference theory suggests that investors prefer to invest in short term as they fear the additional volatility, risk and uncertainty associated with the long-term instruments. Therefore, investors require additional risk premia to hold long-term instruments as against short-term instruments. Both of these theories are often employed to explain the dynamics of term structure of interest rates. To summarize, in this video, we discussed that interest rates might differ for different maturities. This variation in interest rates across different maturities leads to a very important concept called the term structure of interest rates. Term structure of interest rates can be rising as well as falling. Two key theories explain these term structures including expectations theory and liquidity preference theory. To summarize this lesson, fixed income securities like bonds are simply long term loans. These instruments include regular interest or coupon payments and at the maturity you get back the face value or principal amount. The frequency of these payments can be annual, semi-annual, quarterly etc. These instruments can be easily valued through discounting cash flow valuation method. Also, it is appropriate to discount each of these cash flows with its own spot rate corresponding to the duration of the cash flows. The spot rate is observed on the term structure of interest rates. The term structure of interest rates is computed using the strips. These strips are bonds with single cash flows and prices that are easily observed. These strips are created using government bonds and therefore spot rates thus calculated reflect the risk free rates. Finally, once the present value of a bond is computed using bond cash flows, one can also calculate the yield to maturity of the bond. YTM is a single interest rate that equates the bond cash flow with its present value. Another important related concept is that of duration. Duration reflects the average time associated with cash flows of a fixed income security. Duration also reflects the sensitivity of the price of bond with the prevailing interest rates. It has been widely acknowledged that bonds with longer duration are more sensitive to changes in interest rates. Term structure of interest rates is most often upward sloping. The expectations theory of interest rates suggests that rising interest rates reflect the future expectation of investors and market participants. 
that is they are expecting future interest rates to rise the liquidity preference theory suggests that investors prefer to invest short term rather than long term therefore an additional compensation a premium need to be offered to investors to invest in long term instruments in addition the theory of liquidity preference suggests that investors prefer to hold short term instruments as compared to long term instruments an additional premium needs to offered to make them hold long term instruments